So week 16 of the 2017 NFL season is in the books and we had some stuff happen and we still have some stuff hanging in the balance for the playoffs come week 17. Oh baby, so let's take a look back at the week that was week 16 recap, 4th and 10 style, here we go. We gotta start off with the skid marks in brown and orange, the Cleveland Browns cemented their place with the number one overall pick in the 2018 draft, not that it necessarily will matter a whole hell of a lot, with their embarrassing loss to the Bears in Soldier Field in that Snow Bowl on Sunday. The Bears should not be that proud because a couple of things here and there made this game more of a blowout than it actually truly was. The Bears should be embarrassed that they didn't blow out this terrible team by 30 points. In the meantime, for the Cleveland Browns, just when you think it can't get any worse, oh, it still can, baby. You've still got a chance to go 0-16. One game from history. Don't stop now. Speaking of don't stop now, Detroit. The Lions just find a way to be the Lions, don't they? They go into Cincinnati to face a team that has absolutely nothing to play for. Their head coach is quitting. The team has effectively quit. Detroit needs to win and then win against a Brent Hundley-led Packers team in Week 17, and they could have a chance in the playoffs. Sure, they would need a little help, but it would be possible. So, of course, Detroit's going to Detroit and go into a game against a team that's quit and lose them damn selves and get eliminated from the playoffs. Like, it seems like only the Lions can. The Lions are going to Lions, and that's just the way it always is. Meanwhile, in the NFC South, the New Orleans Saints and Carolina Panthers with victories both clinched playoff spots. Both teams at 11-4. and four. It's crazy. The NFC South, technically, that divisional race has not been settled. It will be settled in Week 17, which could cause quite a bit of higher hierarchy madness in terms of the playoff seedings. But both of those teams, teams that weren't necessarily picked to do that much this year, are both sitting there at 11-4. and four. The NFC is a powerhouse conference this year, especially at the top. Speaking of clinching, the Kansas City Chiefs handled the Miami Dolphins and clinched the NFC West. I don't think anybody views them as a threat now, but hey, they got in for the fourth time in five years under Andy Reid. That is an accomplishment in the modern era of professional football. Speaking of an accomplishment, Brock Osweiler thinking that him yelling at the team is going to do anything to rally at them. He tried to rally the troops and they waved the white flag and surrendered. Just like the Browns have, or Broncos have, excuse me, under Vance Joseph this year. You want to talk about a one and done head coach, that's probably it, which is a surprise to me. But them's are the breaks in the National Football League. But it doesn't help when you saddle your first year head coach with a bunch, with a bunch of mediocrity and crap at the quarterback position. John Elway should have to eat the shit for this one. John Elway should be the one to take the blame because you put your guy in a bad situation. But ultimately, Brock, you actually have to be good and actually have to do something at your position to be able to sit there and command the type of respect from your team for them to be able to take and accept a tongue lashing for you and expect it to do anything to help motivate them. It's so ridiculous it's laughable that Brock Osweiler is trying to yell at people like anybody's going to care. Dude, you suck. The hell would they listen to you? It's ridiculous. I tell you, it doesn't suck though. The Los Angeles Rams, they won, and for Todd Gurley fantasy football owners, he had a big, big day for you. If you didn't win your fantasy football championship and you had Todd Gurley in your starting lineup, then that means you suck. Because he had a monster day, an MVP type of day, from an MVP candidate. But you look at the Rams, they've clinched the NFC West. They've got themselves a whole home playoff game under possible coach of the year in Sean McVay. It's amazing how one guy... And a philosophy and a change can make all the difference in the world from a team from one year to the next. And no matter how much Jeff Fisher tries to take credit for what he did, you deserve none of it, Jeff! This is Sean McVay and his staff and these players buying in and believing and getting the job done. And you look at the Rams right now. That offense is hot. The defense is playing better. This is a scary team, even with the second-year quarterback come playoff time. Very scary team. The Jaguars clinched the AFC South, even though they lost on Sunday to a suddenly uh, on-fire 49ers team. And when you look at the Jaguars, you can't be fighting like that. They do kind of have a Seahawks feel to them. Like when it's good, it's really good, and they're dominant. Their defense is kicking ass. Their offense does just enough. 
but you can't be in fighting like that. And you have to be concerned if you're a Jags fan heading into the playoffs because they just gave up 40-something points to the Niners who aren't going anywhere this year. So much for that big-time defense playing big-time in a big spot. Because this was still an important game. Because the Jaguars, with a win, would have at least kept hope alive, potentially, to get a first-round buy in the playoffs if the Steelers lost somehow miraculously to the Browns in Week 17, and the Jaguars win. Now the Jaguars go into Week 17 with nothing to play for, and maybe that's for the best, who knows, because they still got the division title, they still got that home playoff game, but ultimately, man... You can't be fighting like that so close to playoff time. That's not good for team chemistry. That's not good for anything. Um, looking at what else happened around the league, the Seattle Seahawks in a game that on the surface they really shouldn't have had any business winning. The Cowboys had some momentum. The Cowboys are getting Ezekiel Elliott back. You figure they're going to find a way. Zeke's going to have a big day. It's going to be season over for the Seahawks, and the Cowboys have one more chance to potentially sneak into the playoffs after Week 17, and then none of that shit happened. At home, Seattle beat them. So the Seahawks keep their hopes alive. They're on the outside currently looking in. But a win combined with an Atlanta loss, and they're in the playoffs. And either way, the Cowboys are going to be doing what they do best over the past two decades or so under Jerry Jones. They're going to be watching the playoffs from home. Again. It's going to be very interesting in Dallas in this offseason because this is something that should have never happened, but it ultimately did. It's the point that we got to, and the coaches and the players have nobody to blame but themselves because it just shouldn't have happened this way. But meanwhile, the Seahawks keep their hopes alive, and we'll see what happens come Week 17. The Steelers, <clears throat> with their dominant victory over a Texans team that is, for all intents and purposes, quit. Um, clinched a first-round bye in the AFC playoffs, still have hope alive potentially for home field advantage throughout, even though they've got to beat the Browns and they got to hope the Jets beat the Patriots in Week 17. Not likely, but anything is possible. And also the Eagles, with their Monday night victory, clinched themselves first-round bye, clinched themselves home field advantage throughout the NFC playoffs. It's been impressive to see this Eagles team kind of rally around Nick Foles and rally around the circumstances, situation that they have and win the last two games without their MVP candidate, without their franchise quarterback. But you do wonder, now that they've got that first-round bye locked up, the home field advantage throughout the playoffs locked up, are they going to kind of phone it in a little bit in Week 17 and then take that week off and come back really rusty in the divisional round? And furthermore, how much can you really believe in this Eagles team that really hasn't faced too many quality opponents this year beat up mostly on bad teams. Is this really a team you can believe in come playoff time? I don't really know. Uh, but I'm going to close this out by talking about a team that we're not talking about a ton this year, but we might be next year, and that's the San Francisco 49ers. It is amazing how much of a difference a quarterback could make. And I was not a huge fan of Jimmy Garoppolo coming out of Eastern Illinois. I felt like he needed a lot of work. And he was nowhere near NFL ready, and I stand by that, and I believe that. I also thought it was crazy that all these people were pumping up Jimmy G to be the second coming of Jesus G. Christ when he barely played two games last season for the Patriots before he got hurt himself. And all these people talking about getting trading first-round picks to get him and talking about how he was just this presumptive franchise quarterback. I'm like, just because he was coached by Belichick and just because he played behind Tom Brady doesn't necessarily mean anything. This is a guy that would be now in his mid-20s, and effectively, in terms of game experience, he is a rookie. Ding dong, that's wrong, because Jimmy G has played like a freaking G, and now the 49ers have won four games in a row, and yes, it is costing them draft position in the 2018 NFL draft, but once you make the trade for that second, with that second-round pick to get Garoppolo, at that point in time, draft position isn't as important. What you're worried about is seeing growth and development out of Jimmy G. You want to see a guy that you can feel confident in franchising next year, potentially giving long-term money to, and figuring that you've maybe finally got your guy that you could build your franchise around for the long term. And my God, it looks like the San Francisco 49ers, even though it's early, it's only a few games in, it feels like they might just have that. And for all the knocks that John Lynch got and, frankly, the 49ers organization got for hiring him, and for all the knocks that Kyle Shanahan had on him for his play calling, in particular in the Super Bowl, which I kind of understand, there's something brewing there in Santa Clara, not San Francisco, mind you, but San, Santa Clara at the Field of Jeans at Levi Stadium. This 49ers team is coming. They're coming. 
And it'll be interesting to see how quickly it will be them and the Rams that are battling it out for supremacy in the NFC West as the Seahawks and the Cardinals continue their downward slide. It's coming, and it might come as soon as 2018. 49ers fans, this wasn't the year, and next year is probably not the year, but you have a lot of reasons to be excited about this team for 2018 and beyond. You have some nice young talent on the defensive side of the ball, and it looks like you've got your guy at the quarterback position. You could expect a pretty quick turnaround based off of the things we've seen out of John Lynch and Kyle Shanahan so far.